So uh, welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY, and we also uh, welcome our viewers from HowlRound on HowlRound TV. It's a great uh, online platform for nonprofit theater in the United States. It's a great honor for us to have you all here, people who flew in from Paris, from Israel, and France, and, and other places, Germany. So it's a, a, a quite um, a big thing for us. Somehow I feel it might be the biggest event of the year, something we have never done here, a four-day conference on the work of a single artist. But uh, we are talking about Bob Wilson, Robert Wilson, and his legacy, and his work, his omnivorous uh, appetite uh, for life, for art, and for theater. Um, is just uh, 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 legendary, and I think also the scope of our conference pays a little homage to um, the work that he has been done over decades. Uh, he is, in our view, the most significant, important theater makers, maker of the Americas. I think his work could maybe only be compared to a Max Reinhardt, who was also a transatlantic a great uh, theater director in the 30s. His uh, work is astounding and stunning, those drawings, his chairs, the stage design famously the light and of course the staging um, is um, I think almost unmatched uh, by any other artist and especially any living theater artist. Uh, he has worked globally in all continents. Uh, he has engaged very early in the work of African American art also uh, 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 with um, uh, neurodivergent uh, artists. Uh, no one has done that at the time. It's all a little bit fashionable now, but he was very early without having that as an ideology. He just thought they're interesting and good artists. So we're going to look at this also. And I would like to welcome all the speakers here in the room um, who came to participate. This conference will be live streamed uh, on HowlRound. As I said earlier, that means uh, a lot of audience members who normally sit in the room are not here. We'll look at it another time. The Siegel Center did over 200 Zoom talks in the time of Corona. And uh, so we have now a large worldwide global audience and people um, don't come um, anymore just into the room. And so the things have changed, but we feel as an academic institution, we have to open up. We have to uh, go away from the tradition where you just have a limited number of people in a room and it's often not recorded. They are just the papers out. I think this is a great uh, contribution to, um, to his work, and I'm very curious to hear um, all the um, uh, contributions. I would like to thank my colleagues, Markus Wessendorf and Viola Cantor. We worked for a long time to make this uh, happen, and so it's a teamwork. Also, our Siegel team, it's uh, Neosha and uh, Nurit and Mag who uh, made this happen. And um, I think we're going to look forward at 11 o'clock uh, to Maria's uh, talk. She's online. I think she's calling in from the UK, and we also felt it's the time where people come in, fly, uh, and speak a short time, and have have then to go back the next day. Uh, we said we do, we would like to have this in a hybrid uh, form. Uh, some technical notes: if you want to go on the internet, you go on the Wi-Fi GC CUNY community, uh, GC CUNY guest. I think I, we have it also in your conference back. It's uh, mentioned. There's a restaurant in the building. So if you go back to the right side and take an elevator to the eighth floor, so you can have a, a good, cheap, simple meal. It's a, a, it is, um, of course, semester-free time. It's not a good time normally for a conference, August, because people are away, students are away, but it's the only time Bob could join us. We felt it was important to have him here and also to then have the day at Water and at the Watermill Center, which I think makes this truly special um, and unique. Again, um, thank you all um, for coming. If you have a cell phone, check now, and I'll do the same, that it's off. Speaker, yes. And that is important. And again, welcome, and I hand over to Marcus, uh, one of the organizers. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I would also like to welcome everyone joining us um, for this opening day of this international conference on the legacy of Robert Wilson, everyone who's in this room, but also everyone kind of watching online on Hall Round. Um, I would also like to thank Frank and Viola and the Siegel team for having helped us, I mean, for basically, you know, kind of organizing, co-organizing this event. Um, there is a long history th to this event. So actually the, the person who came up with the idea originally will only join us tomorrow, a few days from now, Steve Ernest from North Carolina University. Um, so two and a half years ago, Frank, and I put together this kind of expensive proposal for a restaurant that supports humanity, Swedish Institute 
and I was hoping we applied for two hundred settle two hundred twenty thousand dollars, but of course we didn't get the money, and then uh, we kind of tried to figure out. Um, but then the idea was to perhaps have a conference last year, and then Bob himself kind of asked us to postpone. Uh, the conference by one year because um, he wanted this event to coincide with the uh, opening, the in inauguration basically of the new Bob Wilson archive at, at uh, Watermelt. Yeah, so that's, that's really kind of the longer um, history behind this. I'm so glad, of course, to finally see that this is actually happening, um, which was still relatively unclear, I would say, a few months ago. So thanks to all of you, you know, all the participants who kind of took action on this. And I'm really kind of looking forward to all presentations that we will go to hear in the next year and a half days. So I'll hand over to Viola.
so thank you. And uh, uh, a few words about our center. It's called the Studio Theater Center. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the executive director. We bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. So we might playwrights, writer. We have a publishing line. We uh, have mostly plays. We have a publisher with most books of Arab plays are still in translation. A lot of European work, Indian work. So um, for us, uh, the investigation, the dramaturgical ideas are in the center of this. Me, myself, also, I was once acting in a Bob Wilson play. It was the chorus. I was his assistant. I was also working as his tour manager. So um, it has been also deeply intertwined. And over the years, the studio center had many encounters with Bob Wilson. He was here two or three times. And we have collaborated. So this is right at the center on the Opel. He is slightly overlooked. He's not in the middle of the stage like an American theater, even so his importance um, is uh, so vastly um, significant. So this, this conference is a contribution to encourage young scholars and existing scholars and mature scholars to really show the work, ri write about it, tell us about it, and that we engage it. One of the ideas is Markus Wilsendorf will be the editor for the Robert Wilson yearbook. So I hope it will be come out annually. Whatever you will talk about, you send it to us in a written form, and we would um, then also um, like to publish it. So this will also be an ongoing um, legacy towards um, the work um, of Bob. And the idea also is to highlight and celebrate the opening of the Bob Wilson Archive in Watermill. And next to artists who uh, apply there, they work and research it. Also, scholars can apply. It's still in the beginning. How do we really do that? But it's also a way for you scholars to participate. And um, we are getting now closer to 11 o'clock. We have a couple of more minutes. So we're going to take a little break here. And at 11 o'clock, we have some technical difficulties on my end. It moves to an ongoing system. And then we will welcome Maria Schaffer, who is from the Center in London. And uh, she will talk about the idea of the archive and the purpose of it and the first few notes of the project. Yeah. OK, thank you all. And um, have you had an opportunity to read this? Thank you.
So um, again, welcome back here to the Siegel Siegel Center, and um, thank you all for participating. And welcome to our global audience on HowlRound. And I see here Maria Shevtsova uh, with us. Maria, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Maybe not, but uh, I hopefully we will hear her. So Maria Shevtsova is the professor emerita at the Goldsmith University of London and the editor-in-chief of the New Theatre Quarterly. She's active in outreach activities across the world. Her acclaimed books, including Robert Wilson, 2007, and updated in 2019, and Rediscovering Stanislavski, 2020, include book chapters and articles that have been published in over 15 languages, and she's one of the great uh, grandmasters, we would say, there wouldn't be chess you know, of uh, the theatre, uh, historian, so uh, welcome, uh, Maria, and we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Hang on, this says. By staying in this meeting, you, c you c consent to being recorded. So do I have to press got it or not? Yes, you can press got it to just remove it. And you'll be going live shortly, Maria, to the, okay, the thank thank in the audience. Thank you. How many people are there in the audience? Who, me? Okay, I'm starting. Hello, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and thank you, Frank Henschke, for organizing this with the Siegel Center, also for giving me the great honor of opening up this truly major event for a truly great artist of our time. Thanks to Robert Wilson for being the reason for this symposium, and for being the great artist worldwide on a world scale that he is. Colleagues, you too, you've all been working, so thanks for being here. And uh, above all, let me also thank the audience out there. It's very weird, I just didn't quite know when you would, when I would be actually speaking to somebody on the other side of, 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 of this screen. Now, very briefly, I saw Bob um, recently, two months ago actually, at a conference in Romania, which is one that I had been uh, an honorary um, consultant for. And uh, he brought with him The Tempest, which he had made in 2021 at the uh, Sofia in Bulgaria National Theatre. Um, let me just say briefly, I'm starting with this 2024 version that I saw. I'll go on to Mary said what she said of 2019. From there, I'll, with some references elsewhere, I will focus on Turandot, the opera which uh, Wilson staged in 2018. And there are a few other things that I would like to do after that, including some brief reference to what I call this rather new, I think, well, well what I call the sacred music that Wilson has, has worked with as a director and designer and lighting designer. So that's the movement. But back to, back to the, the Romanian uh, event. After the production, there was a sort of, you know, get together with people post-production get-together, people drinking, laughing, chatting, talking, etc. And Wilson turned to me and said, Maria, I wanted to ask you something. Yes, we'll go ahead. What was your favorite scene in The Tempest? Well, I paused for just a split second and I said, the last. He looked at me in surprise and said, oh, I'd have thought you'd have liked most the first. It wasn't the right moment to say, well, this is because, you know, people were coming to be photographed with Bob and all this usual sort of happy stuff that goes on in these kinds of post-show events. So 
in a sense, I'm giving Bob the answer now that I could not give him then. I'm going to read the first five pages because I want to just set the parameters of the talk. And after that, I will speak. That way I don't have to lean down and look at my text. And that way also I'll get a much better sense of talking to somebody live out there. So thank you. Wilson's The Tempest begins with a phenomenal sea storm constructed by the play of light, sound and timing, which are not synchronized, but in counterpoint and in counterpoint again for juxtaposition against the dark visual imagery so as not to make the scene illustrative, but expressive by association with the event. These are foremost traits of Wilson's aesthetics in relation to which he offsets movement. To itemize them, they are construction by light and where there is light in Wilson, there is color. Light, color, sound, timing, counterpoint, juxtaposition, association and movement. Others will present themselves as we go. Movement in the tempest scene is stylized, which the eye discerns when bodily images suddenly appear in sharp shaped flashes signifying lightning. And these movements flash out and suddenly seem to be still for a split second. Juxtaposition like this of the moving body and the still body is also a Wilson trait. And here it implies, rather than says, the attempt the scenes seemingly many indistinct humans make, twisting in angular fashion, to steady their bodies in the violence of a ship rolled and tossed by a ferocious tempest. Notice that I said still body just now, whereas in fact there is little stillness in Wilson, for there are always tiny movements and also tiny gestures, sometimes so small that they are barely perceptible. Shakespeare's narrative component is embedded in the scene's composition, whose blasting sounds stimulate spectators to conjure up images of thunder and roaring ocean. Thus they see the sound. And this is one of Wilson's fundamental synesthetic principles. The scene suggests colossal cosmic upheaval and the devastation of the planet and its immense sonic buildup explodes into the sound of a gigantic, all-consuming wave speeding straight into the audience. Those of you who have experienced a mini earthquake, a mini earthquake's deep throat growl swelling up at top speed out of nowhere, would have recognized the terrifying, but also thrilling because this is theater, sonic revving up, of the explosive wave, heard but invisible, of Wilson's score. The scene ends abruptly with a swift blackout, followed almost immediately by low light. Its overt theatricality, prodigiously powered sonically, is a metonym for Shakespeare's words, a figurative replacement of them, while nevertheless, relaying their story. Here is a tempest, a shipwreck, people stranded somewhere, which, as in Shakespeare, turns out to be an island. Wilson strips back the story, offering what could be called the gist of its essential parts. Prospero seeks revenge, Miranda, his daughter, and Ferdinand fall in love, the foolish Stefan and Trinculo drink alcohol as they plot a political coup, if braggart matter can be called plotting in anything but a vaudeville type comic ironic sense, which Wilson gives it. Ariel Demure plays the role of Prospero's fairy angel helper, another ironic touch, this one with elegance. Caliban appears, learns to get drunk, and is otherwise subordinated to Stefano and Trinculo's antics. But his role in Wilson's arrangement 
is really no more significant than that of the usurper Duke Antonio, prosperous, treacherous brother and father of Ferdinand, or of Alonso, King of Naples and Prospero's former friend. Antonio and Alonso are shown in an incidental run by magic banquet sequence, attractive for its visible and visual colors. Wilson's is a short version of The Tempest, of short duration too, running only at 90 minutes, that truncated in terms of storyline and especially noticeably of dialogue, can be argued to be as valid in its excisions of, as any other short Shakespeare. And there are plenty of them in the world. Saw some when I was in Romania, but none were most likely reiterated. Be, but they were most likely reiterated because, for instance, the line that followed in Shakespeare's text was too long for the chosen um, beat or meter or rhythm desired in these moments for the production. Sorry, I think I missed part of a phrase. The phrase is a few phrases seemed over repeated, but they were most likely reiterated because, for instance, the line that followed in Shakespeare's text was too long for the chosen beat or meter or rhythm desired in these moments for the production. So the artistic exigency was a matter of the perceived right form rather than one of staying with the right text, the text so called to the letter, but do we need to be reminded that theatre is not the same as literature? What Wilson is doing here recalls the representativeness, the repetitiveness in opera, where at certain points a singer sings the same phrase or sentence from the libretto again to exactly the same music, specifically for formal reasons, that is, the arc of the musical writing requires repetition for musically satisfactory completion. And this occurs quite noticeably in Puccini's Turandot, uh, and Wilson takes it in his stride to complete his own artistic necessity. I'm going to talk a little bit about Turandot soon. More than narrative, then, is at issue in this not immediately evident indirect approach to narrative typical of Wilson's theatre. The production elides to its close and to Prospero alone with Miranda. Uh, with Miranda. Wilson condenses Prospero's lines, but their subject is clearly Prospero's bygone suffering and inner turmoil. And this, his internal tempest, is transcended as forgiveness reconciliation and renewal begin in an atmosphere of peace at play's end. Prospero's spiritual voyage is the core of the production and from it come new beginnings. He la his last scene with Miranda is gently moving and this emergent emotion together with Wilson's elision of Shakespeare's various figures clustered at Shakespeare's end, Antonio and his courtly entourage disappear in Wilson's production, opens with the space, and it opens the space for suggesting that Prospero's last scene is a legacy offered not only to Miranda, but also to all listening and watching in the theatre. The end is my beginning, wrote T.S. Eliot on his own spiritual rebirth. Wilson's focus and closure on this note of the end is the beginning, is a cue to his insight into the spiritual dimension of Shakespeare's play. You can see why I could not speak to Bob about his first scene in The Tempest without speaking about the last. They are essentially two parts of the same scene because Wilson's structure is a straight line, going from tempest to reconciliation, to light in fact, in a continuum of the same thought and action. Further, 
all factors considered, the emergent emotion that I have referred to emanates principally from the actor in the role of Prospero. It comes from something in his manner from deep within him, and this sensation is sustained by the quality of his voice, a long road traveled voice that has been and seen and understood. This phenomenon of attention within is what Wilson calls filling the form. That is, you, the actor, are filling the form from yourself, from whatever you are thinking, feeling, experiencing, imagining, dreaming. And if you are bored, it's going to show. Wilson sets the form to which you, like all his actors, are held down to the last of your, of the angle of your finger. But whatever it is that keeps you centred and permeates the form quietly, unostentatiously, gives it its interest for both actor and spectator. Wilson maintains that without this inner, let us call it an inner energy, the form, however outwardly splendid it may be, is simply empty. It is important for me to say, in, in anticipation of the last section of my talk, that the spiritual in Wilson's work is rarely noticed, let alone written about. Yet it is frequently there, to a lesser or greater degree, depending on the work. It was already there in his utterly innovative Einstein on the Beach, 1976. I saw it for the first time at the Avignon Festival that year incarnated in the white beam of light glowing against black that took 20 minutes to rise from the floor and incredibly slowly to go into a vertical position at the center of the stage. Slowness with nothing to detract from it, measured time while accentuating the sense of time as a palpable phenomenon and also slowly the sense of time as eternal. And all of this happened to one long note held on the organ in the orchestra pit with minor, modulation, minor modulations. That piece was spiritual without signing itself as spiritual. Now the written part is over and I'm going to simply talk very quickly because I think, I don't know if I've got time for conversations at the, for questions at the end, but I'm going to talk as quickly as I can without killing, because speed can kill, as we know. The um, next important work I'm going to refer to is the, 19, the, the year 2019, Mary says what she said. It came in to this period, this grouping that I'm giving you, which is the beginnings, just sort of the eve of COVID, and then two works that I will refer to are in the middle of the COVID um, pandemic. So there's a kind of symbolic significance here. This is a solo piece performed by Isabelle Huppert, who had performed Orlando under uh, Robert Wilson's direction in 1993. And the text is by Daryl Pink, Pink, Pinkney, who was also the writer of the text for Orlando all those years ago. What I want to do is pick up the thread of sound as an element of construction, because sound in Wilson also means music, and the music of Ludovic Eonardi is inter inter integral to that construction made by um, Huppert, specifically with her voice. What matters here, apart from her enormously flexible voice, is the fact that here is a mass of language and the density and the mass give a great deal to its concentration. The vital importance of language needs to be stressed because it isn't always as important as it is here in this particular production. Um, what what Huppert does is to 
play with pace, time, direction of voice, like the direction of her movements, her walking, her pacing, sometimes the pace turns into a canter. The overall impression is of a choreographed piece. I wrote long ago an essay in 1995 in, um, what's it called? Performance Forum, I think, a journal that was, no, Theatre Forum, sorry, a journal that was published in California in those years, in which I speak of the vocal choreography of Huppert's work and how she works this vocal choreography into the movement choreography, which is there as well as she's constantly moving to whatever she says and with whatever she says or against whatever she says. The event if we're going to talk about kind of a narrative moment, is Mary Queen of Scots on the eve of her execution by her cousin Elizabeth I. What is very striking, particularly for somebody who knows Wilson's work well, is the way in which this density and the focus, the concentration, are all ways of actually letting be felt the emotions that are in some ways related to the situation and the figure speaking and moving. This is a kind of filling in the form again. Um, and when I say emotion, let's be clear, emotion for Huppert, as for Wilson, as for myself, certainly myself speaking here about Wilson, emotion does not mean emotive. It doesn't mean histrionics, and it doesn't mean acting emotion or acting out emotion or straining emotion to make it appear. It's a very different process, this process of filling in the form, which the performer fills in a way that is quite personal, since we don't get into the performer's head and don't know what this person is working with. I think finally what I want to say here is that this sonorial quality of the whole is also a means for eliciting emotion, not only in the performer, but also in the spectator. And if I'm stressing this perhaps a little more than I intended, it's because there has been a long, sometimes overtly stated myth that either speaks of Wilson's work as being icy cold, or simply says that there is no emotion ever in it. I think that's not altogether accurate. Let me just finally say that I noticed thinking about this as I've noticed before writing on Wilson, that there are very subtle shifts and changes in perspective and means. The means don't look like they're the same. In many ways, the elements that he uses artistically, those aesthetic elements, are very much the same. But the means shift slightly. And what shifts quite significantly, at least from my point of view as a spectator and scholar of Wilson, is that the intricacy, which was so fascinating in Orlando in 1993, when Huppert wasn't the famous star she is today. She was an up and coming famous, but now she's huge. Um, the, the intricacy was also compounded and extended by a marvelous sound score, a lot of it of breaking glass, beautifully timed as if timing was so important in Wilson for Orlando. Now that intricacy where she actually stressed syllables, um, worked very strongly, you know, with spitting words out, with actually your roaring them out in many ways, with just truncating and breaking the language, which was part of the fascination of that work. Here it's quieter, it's calmer, it's less intricate. And the less intricate in this particular case of Wilson's oeuvre is a very powerful means of holding this one and a half hours, it's 90 minutes again, of solo with all the energy and concentration that Isabelle Huppert needed for it. I mentioned music, and this is my entree 
into talking about an area that I feel is has produced some of Wilson's greatest masterpieces. And these are the grand opera, as the jargon goes, for this kind of opera. He does, of course, folk opera. My book on Robert Wilson talks about the differences uh, of these various kinds of music theatre, as I call it in general, that he works with. But I'm choosing for this conversation today, grand opera. And my example, my first example, if I can get as far as a second one, is Turandot, the 2018 Turandot, um, which of course is Puccini and has Puccini's sumptuous melodies, the motifs, the refrains, the repetitions that I talked about of singing earlier, the assertions, the humour, great humour in which Wilson uses very wisely and, and, and very succinctly in, uh, in his production. And of course, the multiple emotions which he follows, which Wilson follows with tremendous sensitivity. Wilson understands really perfectly clearly that music is about emotions. Music is what has to be heard in the theatre when people sing. And it's not, it's they have to hear the orchestral music and above all, what the singing voices are telling them. And to have the possibility to do this as a spectator in the theatre, I mean, if you're an opera girl you're like I am, you know exactly what it means. The possibility for listening and really hearing that music and the singing the, the, is, is helped when the stage is uncluttered, when the, you know, it's got, when you get rid of all the furniture and the distracting paraphernalia, the clutter of opera can be horrendous. And Wilson is also very aware that uncluttering also means spacing bodies in that space, particularly when it comes to the chorus, because the chorus can be just this huge brrr on the stage. And it's not always successful to have it as a brrr on the stage, particularly because the chorus never sings really on its own. It works with the soloists. It's not an addendum or an appendum. So that um, what happens in Turandot is the tremendously subtle spacing of chorus. Sometimes it looks very clearly as two parts of the stage. Sometimes it's in lines, but there's always breathing space wherever that chorus is placed. And the breathing space is also given to the soloists. So that the, the, the three main ones here are uh, Caliph, actually four, Caliph, the unknown prince who has to, who falls in love with Turandot at first sight and takes up the challenge of the three riddles. So answered correctly, it means he has her hand. Answered wrongly, he dies. We are told in the opera that there are hundreds that have died because of Turandot's uh, placing of the riddles and refusing refusing to submit really essentially to love and also to what she sees as the power and the control of men. So the spacing between um, Turandot is very, between Turandot and the other three, so it's Turandot, Caliph, the unknown prince, who goes for the challenge, uh, Liu, who is a slave and loves uh, Caliph, and Caliph's father, Tumur, who had been um, kicked off his throne and is in exile, and they meet uh, he and his son and Liu quite by accident on the eve of an execution. This is the moment just after the, just, just before the execution that Caliph falls in love with Turandot. It's not an easy story. How does one handle it? Well, I think here what we need to say is two things. The spacing, very careful, so that it is not tight, but also not too big. So it gives just enough room for what needs to be communicated. Secondly, in the same sort of bracket of spacing, is the idea of something Wilson very carefully does, particularly in this opera, is the restraint of gesture and movement. No operatic gestures, 
they look really, those of you who do Qigong, they look like some of the Qigong steps that I do. It is all a way of controlling wide, operatic, stereotypical, cliched gesticulation. It's also a way of concentrating attention of the ears, the eyes and the heart as you watch. The other point that I want to make here is that of the voice. Music, as Wilson sees it, rightly in my view, conveys emotion, but in opera it must convey it through the singing voice. In fact, it's really no different than the Tom Waits music song that he uses in The Tempest or the fantastic Tom Waits, Tom Waits score and libretti of uh, those great masterpieces, 1990 Black Rider and the 2000 uh, Wojciech. But here in the operatic world, it is really very important that the voice do its work. And the voice is not there to entertain you. It is there actually to move you. It is there to give you a strong emotional connection with what is happening on the stage. So the voice is essential in having its freedom so it can soar and be itself and work at its pace and rhythm, always, of course, in relation to that musical score, because there's a conductor that's conducting, and you can't just go off and do your own thing while, while you are soaring away, expressing what you need to do through that voice. The fact that Wilson uh, restrains physical movement is vital, vital to the capacity for spectators. Again, it's the uncluttering, the uncluttering so that the spectators can actually enter into a kind of communion with that singing voice. Music has its massive reverberations. I won't have time to say much about that other great opera masterpiece. There are several of them, but I'm only talking about two, which is La Traviata. And I'm going to refer to it in its Russian version, the version made in Perm. Well, it was sung in Italian, but but in it was made in it was well it went on tour from Linz first of all in 2015 to Perm in 2017 and to 2018 in Luxembourg where I went to see the opera. The conductor in Perm is the great and wonderful Theodor Kurentis, and Kurentis had a magical way of working with the singer and the orchestra so that when um, when Violetta dies, she dies, the music goes into silence, and it's uncanny how, I'm still getting goose flesh as I think of it, it's uncanny how you still hear the reverberations of that music in the silence. I wrote a long essay called Wilson's Sonosphere in a book um, called North American, Great North American Director, something like that, published in, in I don't know, 20 whatever year it was, 20. 2019 by Bloomsbury. So if you look it up, it'll it'll allow you to follow through my thinking on this whole question of silence and the reverberation of music, and particularly in La Traviata. Wilson and I talk about it in the marvelous uh, conversation I had with him, which was published in New Theatre Quarterly, the journal I edited at Cambridge University, and that came out in 2022. So we're talking about the end of the COVID, although the conversation took place when COVID was still reasonably rife. That's La Traviata, knocked on the head <laughs> very quickly. Now let me just close because I'm looking at the clock on my table in case Frank does want to give people time to ask me any questions. Um, I want to close with this notion of the spirit, with a work that is 2020, the height of the pandemic, and one which precedes it by five years, the 2015 um, Arvo Pert work, which Wilson called Adam's Passion. Just very quickly. The, the Messiah, I'll start with that. It is not Handel's Messiah, but Mozart's reworking and of Messiah, reworking it to sound more apparatic than the oratorio style Handel Messiah. And probably all I can say about it, 
but refer you back again to the conversation with Robert Wilson in New Theatre Quarterly. All I can really say about it in this lack of time is that it is led very strongly by a solo dancer, a marvellous Greek dancer called Alexis Fusekis. And what is very striking when you watch and when you think about it afterwards is the fact that this dance really is the dance, well, it's the dance of the ether. It's not the dance of the earth. The whole work is called the Messiah. So we can already see its significance for any kind of spiritual contextualization. And I would, if I had the time to contextualize for it, very much contextualize it into a new category I would add to my book now, which is that of sacred music. Music is everywhere in Wilson anyway. It's all in his dramatic stuff as well. But here, it's a particular kind of music, and it picks up this spiritual thread that I had referred to earlier. Adam's Passion, let's close with that, perhaps link it to the Messiah, because some of the images in the Messiah of a hanging tree, of a you know, rooted tree that seems to be just all the roots, a filigreed, lacy, beautiful thing hanging in the sky, is very much the idea of the tree of life. And somewhere here is really a very important linkage between the spirit and humanity. If I had time, I'd talk about some of the last lines in Turandot, in which Turandot tells Curry she was not human. And he tells her she is going to be now reborn. Let's end it on that. It seems like the right note to end it on. Thank you. Frank, I don't know. Do you want anyone to speak, to ask? Is there time? What's happening? Someone, help. Yes, there's a time for Q&A. Can you hear us, Maria? I don't have any sound. Oh, Lord um, God, what's going on here? Let's just have a look. Hello? Can you hear us? She has to put her uh, our audio. Uh, maybe Luisha, can you put our audio on? If it works like that, down here, um, maybe. Can you hear us now, Maria? Can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Can Somebody. You um, Hello. Uh, Mar uh, I am unmuted. No, I'm unmuted. I can hear you now, but I'm unmuted and there was no sound. What did you say to press shift? Ah, whatever. No? Uh, come here, Marcos, yeah. So we have one question. Uh, so Neusha, shall I go on to Hal now? Maria, can you hear me? Yeah, we can repeat the question. Marcus, what's the question? Who's my, that? Okay, my question would be... There's some um, I don't okay. understand, sorry. So my question would be, I'm very interested in the notion of the spiritual. And of Can't course, hear a thing, just a voice blurred. Okay, so my, my question is really about the, the notion of the spiritual, because, okay. you've, because you've discussed... And listen, Neusha. When this finishes, to get on to Hal, I just go straight on to Hal. Is that right? To hear the other people? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what was the question? Okay. Anyway, we're on time. I finished I finished bang on the on the dot. Okay. 
Okay, so my, my question is, has to do with the notion of the spiritual, uh, because, because you discussed it uh, with regard to, I don't know, three very different yeah. productions by Wilson, uh, Einstein on the Beach, uh, the Avo Pert piece, uh, Messiah, and of course, actually also kind of... Oh, yes, dot. indeed, Kandinsky, great painter, yes. So, so my Many question relates to what constitutes the spiritual in Wilson's work is it primarily a question of form, namely of the separation of elements? Yeah, so what you seem to indicate that it's particularly those moments where there is space. But what's the question? That's silence, statements, form, separation of elements. That kind of, that, you know, where the spiritual kind of comes into place. I mean, it would be, that would, that's my major question. How would you kind of... Where does what? <laughs> So how is the spiritual constituted in Wilson's work? Because obviously Einstein on the beach... Well, I gave an example, the 20-minute beam in Einstein on the beach, when I said it already begins there. We see it very early in the work. We see it in the reverberations of, of, of the music and in the way Violetta dies, which I haven't had time to discuss, when she also lifts her finger to indicate the importance of love as divine. That's, you know, it's, something doesn't have to be spelt out to be spiritual, as I just said earlier. You need to see it, that's all. Okay. It's there. Okay. It's there in La Traviata. It's there in Turandot. It's not a big slogan that says, this is spiritual. My, my question was really more, it, it, it's a, I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it depends on a particular you asked if, form. you know, where do I see it? I gave you some answers. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I can't, of course, hear anybody, so it's impossible to speak here. Uh, another comment or question? Viola? Um, I would ask, um, what, what uh, changes did Maria observe over the decades I in can't Bob's hear work? Word. Uh, the and I'm not muted, so you know I don't know what's so going way, on. So, uh, in Bob's work, um, what major changes does she observe over the decades of engaging with Bob's work? Well, I gave one which I find very significant, uh, particularly thinking about it these last weeks in preparation for today, and that is making it less intricate, streamlining it. I find his engagement with opera increasingly compelling. Um, also, you know, he started with opera. He started with Einstein on the beach, if you can see. And that's not even the beginning. There's earlier work, as we know. But his engagement with opera, it seems to me, is very fundamental in these later years of his work. His ability to shift across from the dramatic theater which is always done anyway but to shift across from what he's done with music theater and how he's built the repertoire of his work in opera is i think something to be noticed it's not necessarily a major change but it's a shift of attention and that's so that shift i think affected something like the 19 the 2021 uh, uh, tempest too it means that dealing with a textual work like a shakespearean text is in some ways bolder i would say i think hamlet was a very bold piece of work and i think it's one of his marvelous works but it's bolder dealing with a multi vocal work like uh, The Tempest too, and dealing it not with it not as a monologue as Hamlet was dealt with, but as a fully fledged dramatic piece. Those are some of the, the uh, changes that I see. I don't think Wilson has stayed still ever anyway. I mean, if you've looked at my book, you'll see that I see a number of things, something like six categories with subheadings and I'm not a freak for all these kind of subheading things, you know. I don't think it's all that terribly important because, in fact, 
Wilson, Wilson's work is one long continuum. And the crossovers with between the works are sometimes not so obvious, but a closer study of them shows them to be interconnected. I think there's a kind of wholeness uh, in the work that needs to be noticed, particularly if we're going to be talking in the next few days about his legacy. Does that answer your question, Marcus? I can't see you, I'm sorry, and I can't hear you. Thank you so much. Um, you've engaged with Wilson's work for such a long time. Can it's you terrible speak? disadvantage not to be able to hear anyone. Can you speak about your first encounter with Wilson's work and how it has impacted you and how his work has impacted you as a scholar? I mean, I know you had problems with sound years. earlier, but it's definitely affecting me. I can hear you, yeah, no problem. Okay. It's okay, no problem. Thank you for bearing with, with taking the time. I don't want to run over time. So if Frank says no more, I'll say no more. It was Einstein on the beach, 1976 at the Avignon Festival in Paris. And it was the second, I think, Avignon Festival ever. I've forgotten. I'd have to look at my notes. It was a, it was a blowout experience. I saw it subsequently, of course, as did so many people of my generation. That was my first encounter. You mean for me personally? Or for me, well, for me personally. You know, I have a background in dance. So my, I began professional life as a dancer. Uh, I'm a teacher. It didn't occur to me at the time that a dancer could teach dance for some reason. Ask me why. I have no clue. I wanted to teach. That was my big thing. And um, Einstein on the beach had this enormous impact that showed me the great openness of the theatre world, that it could be a thousand things. And this was one of those unbelievable thousand of things that made theatre really worthwhile. I have worked specifically, I don't, you probably don't know anything much about my work, but I have worked very much for years now on European theatre directors. And in my book, in both editions, I speak of Robert Wilson as an American European director. This is not an accident. Look at his biography. Look at the works where they were first premiered and who financed them and how they were received and how he's been invited back and the significance as we talked about in my conversation with him in that 2020 piece I referred you to. The importance held that he holds in these in these European countries, France, who invites him on his 80th birthday, where he celebrates uh, also the Autumn Festival, which did his marvelous deaf man glance. Um, um, uh, France, which which financed Einstein on the beach, you know, France, which financed so much work, but not only France. Italy, Germany, Sweden. We could go through Eastern European countries. The Russians, if we didn't have this ghastly war, we'd probably be having Robert Wilson back working again. His Pushkin's fairy tales is a tremendous achievement, a beautiful work. So, you know, I placed Wilson very much in the corpus of my vision about European theatre or theatre in Europe might be another way of putting it. I've put it that way several times because not all theatre in Europe is made by Europeans. So, you know, Europeans, born Europeans, so to speak, I don't know whatever the right terminology here is. So Wilson's effect on me was to really show me that here was another way of looking at things. Um, much of the stuff I'd seen 
pre the 80s, I would say, was rather boring, a very textual oriented British style theatre, which I don't like, didn't like then and don't like now. It's not that kind of theatre that I write about. I write about what I consider to be the, the, the great innovators of the late 20th and the 21st century. And Wilson, for me, is certainly one of them and one of the foremost ones. So that's the long term answer, the longer journey from the immediate, oh, wow, part of it when I, you know, when I was a young student in Paris in 1976. I hope that answers your question. I'm really sorry I can't see you. Um, <clears throat> Maria, here's another question. Um, I know in your Rutledge book at the very end you even included exercises, but the big question is, is Robert Wilson teachable? You're a professor, or you're a mentor, or you're a... Um, uh, uh, someone who guides students. Uh, wh how, what is your experience in teaching, quote unquote, Robert Wilson? Ah, that's a fantastically interesting question. Listen, some years ago, I can't remember exactly, you know, I'm getting on in time and all the years are blurring and I'm working my ass off. So, you know, here we are. I'm trying to remember dates. Several teachers from a university came up to me at, at, a, at a symposium my students were running because I was training them how to run symposia. I thought they needed to learn how to do that and be an extra bow to their professional string. And they came up to me and said, we love these things. And they, keep, they kept coming. And they say, we think your exercises are phenomenal. We've been using them in the classroom to teach students how to act and how to move. I said I had a dance background. I'm not what I call a practitioner. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a sociologist of the theatre. I'm an analyst of theatre. I work very hard on following through. I mean, I've followed Robert Wilson since 1975. But I've also followed other directors from that period. Ariane Nushkin, for example, I followed all her life. It's hard going following these great directors. It's tough work. You know, just turn up at the theatre, you know, and it's expensive. You've got to get there. So um, I don't count myself as a practitioner, but I used to run in my university a course on movements because it's something I can do. And I can do it without feeling that, you know, I just didn't know enough about this stuff to do it, to actually teach it. And some of those exercises I actually used just to heighten my students' awareness of the possibilities of moving. Moving in counterpoint, for example, which they couldn't do. Placing themselves in relation to each other in juxtaposition, which is a, a, a Wilson phenomenon, you know, very much an important feature of his work. It can work, it does work. But it, you know, I think I think teaching Wilson might be like teaching Stanislavski, i.e., people are going to invent a Wilson that maybe isn't there, like they invented a Stanislavski naturalist, for God's sake, who was definitely not, ne never was, and never wanted to be, and resented being caged in this way. But that was part of the um, use of. How people use Wilson is going to very much depend on how closely they pay attention to what they are finding out about him. And then I guess... They will have to do what they think they can manage and they will have to do how they can manage. And whether it is Wilson or not Wilson is going to be, be the big question for anybody watching. I think that is really, truly what is going to happen. But the blunt answer to your question, or whoever asked you, Frank, whoever asked this question, is yes, it works. I've had people telling me, not just that particular group of, of professors from universities who used my exercises and thought they were great. Various others over the years have popped up and said, we use your exercises. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, we came down to the closing minutes um, of your talk, Maria. Thank you really um, for participating, um, for um, uh, being with us. We are almost um, out of time. We apologize uh, for the uh, technical complications. Um, we had to download a new uh, OBS broadcast system for our partner, and we are still trying to adjust it with the, within the university system, but we heard you very clearly, and uh, it was a beautiful opening talk. Any uh, last minutes? What are you working on at the moment uh, uh, next, of course? 
that you prepared for us? What is what are you working on, and what, well, what are if, your focus? Well, if you, uh, apart from Robert Wilson, <laughs> because yes. if you if you yes. want to do a book on this, I'm going to write up what I said. I mean, I've got most of it written. I just wanted to speak, and of course, when you leave your text and you speak, you risk forgetting some of the important things that you wanted to say. But that's life, you know. We have to speak to each other. I think that's fundamental. I'm also going to go back to some of my work on Stanislavski because I have created a furore really over what I've written about Stanislavski. I think it's fundamental to say the things I've said about him. Stanislavski, you'll be surprised to hear this, reminds me of Wilson and vice versa on certain points, not on all, but on certain points, and that's a fascinating discovery. So I'm going to follow through some of those insights that I've had into Stanislavski and see if I can make more sense of it, particularly his work on opera, which is fundamentally really important and exciting in the way that Wilson's work on opera is exciting, with, interestingly, quite some important connections between the two, which makes one really think, what is it about the very great artists that they somehow connect? in some sort of way, if you can see the connection. Fantastic, wonderful. Well, that's the idea also for the conference to see how does it all connect. Uh, it's a rhizome, it's a network, a spider web where you pull on one edge and everything moves and there is a deep connection and perhaps it's not a linear one, it's a spiral um, that goes uh, back yes. and forwards in time in the history of exactly. modernity. Exactly, and it's like brambled and it's like interlocked roots of trees you know I've got to slowly unpick them without damaging the roots and without damaging the tree you know but you've got to put those roots back into that earth for it to grow Thank it you. is exactly that and that is the process good very good and I hope our conference will do the good thing and not damage the roots but reinforce them and will be some good fertilizer <laughs> thank you so very 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 much for preparing and to be the opening speaker it's a great honor to have you here for our conference speakers we will meet again at two o'clock um, there are a couple of little places outside on fifth avenue where you can go or again take the elevator go to the eighth floor there is um, an in-house restaurant here uh, with some limited offerings, but still, it's uh, in the building. So thank you all uh, very much, and uh, my, con my special thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. So you're getting a big applause. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I'm glad. I wish I could hear it. It would be lovely to hear. It would make yeah. me remind me. I, I would think I was back in the theater. <laughs> I'm going to see you in the next meeting, so I'll see you then. It'll be a different time zone because I'm London, as you know. Yeah. <laughs>